might have taken over from Jack, who took over from John. I think I've got the legacy right there. I might have missed something, so apologies if I've done that. And so part of that is to organize a seminar, and that's actually been a really, really fun process for me so far. Uh, we've got a nice lineup of presenters for the semester. If you haven't looked at the schedule, please do look at that at some point. Um, encourage other people to come. And then maybe most importantly, if you have ideas for presentations or people to give those presentations, self-nominated or other, please do let me know, send me an email. Um, I'd be very happy to see if we can get those people on the, um, on the agenda schedule. So like I said, this semester is mostly full, but we are scheduling people into the spring already. Uh, we are, you know, it's the CPAP climate, people, environment, right? So it's very broad. So we are very much interested in having talks across the whole range of topics. Um, and so I think you'll see that already this semester, um, but, but we want to continue that in the, in the coming semesters as well. And just one other thing to emphasize there, that can be someone who's on campus here, but it's certainly someone that can be off campus as well. And we have some funds to bring, uh, to bring those people. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say. There are uh, cookies and uh, coffee in the back, so help yourself. Uh, if it's not too distracting, I think you could probably sneak up even during the presentation and get a refill. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Luke and, and ask him to present our speaker today. So, sure. It's my uh, pleasure to present Chelsea Volpano as a today's speaker. So Chelsea is a PhD candidate in the Geoscience Department, uh, where she worked on her PhD with me. Um, before she was here, Chelsea first worked in UW Sheboygan for a few years, and then after that, she went to UW Milwaukee, where she was an undergrad. At UW Milwaukee, she got interested in working on sort of coastal processes uh, with a colleague of mine, Elmo Rawling. We sort of drug her over here where she did her master's. Uh, focused a lot on using numerical modeling and uh, observations from Lake Michigan to understand coastal growing processes. Since then, she sort of expanded on that, used more sophisticated numerical modeling techniques. Uh, she's mainly focused on understanding things in the near shore and things that are sort of interesting and different about the Great Lakes with respect to the ocean and marine trails. And things like that. And so at this point, uh, Chelsea's far exceeded any capability I ever had in any of these uh, techniques, and you know, really is probably the premier you know near shore coastal modeler in the Great Lakes. Uh, so when the Great Lakes have more coastline than California and Florida put together, and this is the preeminent modeler right here. So if you want to know something, uh, her should leave this charge here and talk about the Lake Michigan coast and climate and system in flux. Well, thank you for that uh, generous introduction. So, yeah, I'm Chelsea. I'm going to be talking about Lake Michigan coast and climate. So, um, Luke's talking about my research looks mostly at the near shore. So, I'm looking at connecting um, things that are going on um, on the flux and on the shorelines with things that are going on in the near shore. Um, when we think about coastal numerical modeling, again, we think mostly about ocean coasts, um, and rightfully so. They're a big component of that um, global kind of region or landform system. Um, but as you can see from my picture here, coastal erosion is a really big um, agent of change on the Great Lakes as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on um, in the present day, how we can understand it kind of in the lens of climate change, um, some of the research that I've been doing to try to understand these processes. So to start off, I'm going to show you something that you've all probably seen before. So on these are all for Americans. So we have the y-axis in um, degrees Fahrenheit and then sea level change in inches. So on the left, you can see um, we're increasing the CO2 concentration compared to pre-industrial levels. And with that increase in CO2, we're seeing increases in temperature. Um, with that increase in temperature, we're seeing um, greater melting of polar ice caps, mountain glaciers, funnel expansion of seawater. And so we're seeing this um, rise in sea levels so from about 1880 to 2020, we see about 10 inches of net sea level rise, um, which um, obviously has pretty big implications for the coastline. So the projection, um, different climate models for this um, are expecting increased rise, so that's going to continue monotonic change is increasing. Um, this graph shows two um, projections of sea level change under different um, emission scenario, so the blue is the lower emission scenario, red is a higher emission scenario. I'm going to focus on the red here because it's most relevant, relevant for my purposes. Um, by about 2100, we're expecting to see about a meter of sea level increase, um, and by 2200, about two meters. Um, 
right, but why am I talking about sea level rise? Because I'm here to talk about Lake Michigan. Um, I want to get you thinking about the magnitude of this rise. So two meters would be devastating for coastal communities, infrastructure. Um, we see increased erosion, flooding, um, all these huge um, devastating consequences. Um, but that's, right, 200 years into the future. So again, just think about the magnitude of that sea level rise. And then when I tell you that Lake Michigan experienced a rise of about two meters over a six, period, or six year period, um, we can think about some of those changes and how devastating they were um, for the community. So we're seeing uh, lots of erosion on the bluffs, on the beaches, um, damage to infrastructure, um, just, just lots of consequences that, that we need to deal with um, in the present day, not in 200 years in the future. Lake Michigan isn't the only lake that um, experiences these high water level fluctuations. So we have the Great Lakes water levels from about 1920 to 2023. The blue is the average monthly lake level, and then the red is going to be the, um, the long-term average, so the historic average. And you can see kind of this dagger tooth pattern. Those are the seasonal highs and lows. Um, and then you also see these longer term fluctuations, not only between highs, but between lows. So we're going above the average by about a meter, but we're also expanding below the average by about a meter. And we think about sea level change um, as sea level rise most of the time on ocean coasts, but in the Great Lakes, we have to deal with both of those extremes, not only the highs, but also the lows. Um, and those lows can be just as devastating, especially in the Great Lakes, we use timber for a lot of our coastal infrastructure, and once that becomes above the water line, it starts to, um, rot basically and then you see a lot of damage to infrastructure um, so coping with the lows are just as um, hazardous or um, implicative as, as the um, ultimate rise is so again here's that rise we saw from 2014 to 2020 and um, that's going to represent kind of this longer term pattern it incorporates the seasonal signal signal but it's also incorporating this longer term rise so what's causing this um, rise and fall in Great Lakes level? It has to do with the net basin supply, basically the mass balance between um, the precipitation coming into the lake and evaporation coming out of the lake. Um, and those are all dealing with the surface area of the lakes um, as opposed to the watershed in general. So those are the most um, variable and the biggest contributors. So you can think precipitation and evaporation are gonna vary with the climate. Um, and we have to deal with not only the winter and spring fluctuations, but also those patterns on a larger scale like ENSO and the NAO. Um, and that irregularity in the um, previous slide that I showed, that long-term fluctuation um, is going to have to do with those cycles kind of super impeding or super imposing on each other. So not only are you dealing with three or five year cycle, you're dealing with that five year cycle superimposed on a 30 year cycle um, and so on and so forth. So as far as future climate change in the Great, um, Great Lakes region, we've uh, had some folks do studies um, trying to predict what we're um, going to expect to see. And I just included some um, kind of brief quips about, about what changes we might see. Um, as far as precipitation, um, we're expected to see increased winter and spring precipitation, increased variability, so more extremes in that precipitation, more droughts, more extreme uh, precipitation events. And then an increase in um, annual mean temperature by about two degrees, uh, two to three degrees um, Celsius, depending on the uh, emission scenario. So I'm going to talk specifically about a couple other aspects of climate change, most notably how the lake levels are going to respond and how we're seeing changes in lake ice. Um, so for the lake levels here, I have for the um, the four Great Lakes um, dynamic systems. So Lake Michigan Huron is basically um, at equilibrium water levels. They're so fully connected that they're one system. But what we're seeing is the um, historic um, observations in the dark black line, and then each of these little um, blocks is going to be a 30-year sequence of um, lake level predictions um, on different emission scenarios. So we have 1.5 degrees C up to 3 degrees C. And what I want to point out is um, we cannot know observationally exactly what the lake levels are going to do, but what we can do is say, here's the envelope of what the lake levels might be um, might be expected to do. So what I want to point out from the slide is we're increasing the range, so we're increasing the magnitude of the highs and lows, and then another component of this is we're expecting to increase the rate at which it um, basically traverses from high to low. So we're increasing the magnitude and the frequency of this variability. As far as ice cover, I have some observations here. So it's the percent um, maximum ice coverage. Those are the blue dots here. 
Um, and what I want to point out is this linear fit that's been given to the data. Um, and so since 1963 or so, we've been seeing a net decrease in the um, maximum ice cover um, for any given season. And this is going to have big implications for not only the net basin supply, but also the coastal processes, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So ultimately, we have these um, suggestions of what might happen to the Great Lakes climate, but um, the fact is the Great Lakes are still pretty understudied as far as what the coastal processes in the present are. And so that's, um, again, most of what my PhD is focusing on is kind of um, trying to put a better um, figure on some of these processes that we see occurring in the present um, so that we can start predicting what might change in the future. So I'll give you a little outline here. I like to put things on my to-do list just to cross them off. So we have the introduction done. Um, I'm gonna give you a really brief kind of um, primer on Wisconsin coastal geology, just so you're familiar with the deposits. Um, and then the first project that I wanna to talk to you about is the role of nearshore ice. So what happens when you stick ice into the nearshore system? How does that change the sediment transport? Um, and then I'll kind of go to the onshore component of that, which is the freeze thaw lake levels and the nearshore connection. That's the more preliminary work that I'm doing. And then I'll wrap up with some of the, um, again, going over the climate implication or the climate projections and implications for what my research means um, in that scope. So my um, advisor, Luke, is a glacial geologist. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the last ice age. So um, most of Wisconsin's glacial deposits come from the um, last ice age in Wisconsin. So for the past two million years or so, there have been um, advances and retreats of the ice sheets, um, and those have left different coastal deposits. And the um, ice sheets are pretty good at wiping out previous um, glaciations, and so most of the deposits we're seeing are from this, again, most recent glaciation. Um, and what those look like basically are these layer cake stacks on the coastline. So we have these tall bluffs, and then you might be able to see the layers within there. Those are different um, glacial deposits, either directly um, deposited by the glaciers or deposited by glacial processes, so outwash um, or lacustrian sediments. Um, and the reason that these layers are important is because it, um, they have varying uh, amounts of sand, silt, um, clay, and these deposits um, basically set up how vulnerable the bluff is um, to coastal erosion. So depending on the amount of sand, the amount of clay, um, you're gonna see variable responses to erosion. Along the coastline, we see um, a couple of different um, types of bluffs. So we have some um, lower, some higher. Typically, they're lower in the southern part of the state, and then they increase in height towards the top. Um, I'm gonna give you a really difficult where's Waldo and see if you can try to find me in either of these pictures. Just so I can take a drink. <laughs> so, um, dangerously close to the edge, my parents would be disappointed to see. But what you can see from this is, if I'm the scale bar, this is about a 30 meter bluff, and then over on the right side is going to be about 140 feet. So there's a really big discrepancy in, in some of the height of these bluffs um, as you go up and down the shoreline. That will come up later, um, but mostly what I want you to walk away with is that bluff erosion supplies basically all of the sand we see in our near shore. So when I'm looking at the shape of the near shore profile, I'm trying to figure out how much sand is moving around and what it's doing. Um, there's kind of a saying where you can either protect the bluffs or you can protect the beaches, but you're not going to be able to do both at the same time because if you cut off, if you protect the bluff, you aren't adding sediment into the near shore anymore and those beaches are going to start uh, kind of wasting away. So when we think about bluff erosion, um, we think again about the stable angle that the bluff is at. This is called the angle of repose and it's dictated by the amount of sand or clay, um, the type of deposit that the bluff is made of. Um, if we have a certain bluff and we raise the lake levels, then we're going to start seeing wave attack at the base of that bluff. It's going to start over steepening and it's going to no longer be at this stable angle. And so what it's going to do is this red surface represents kind of the failure surface that's propagating up the top of the bluff until eventually we see we're back at this stable angle, but we've seen some amount of lateral um, recession at the crest. So when we think about lake levels coming um, up and down, we all have to think not only about the nearshore profile, but how that's influencing bluff erosion and vice versa. Um, nearshore configuration is basically the main determinant on how much wave energy is um, influencing the total of bluff, so it kind of sets up that cycle of over-steepening and then failing back to a stable slope. Um, 
The first project I'm going to talk about again is what happens when you put near shore ice into the system and how does that kind of affect this, um, this cycle. So the Great Lakes are um, interesting and unique because they're um, subject to freeze thaw and ice processes in the winter. And so oftentimes what we get is this scenario where we have the shoreline here and then we have ice growing out to a certain depth um, and then kind of this freeboard ice scenario um, where it's presenting a vertical face to, to the oncoming waves. So in schematic view, that's what we're looking at here. So the ice is attached to the shoreline, it extends out a certain way. And then what happens at this point is the waves are breaking here, it starts to pile up ice on top, and in order to support that cryostatic load, it has to start expend, um, extending down to the bottom. So there's gonna be some point where the ice grounds to the bottom, and you get that vertical face that's presented. And what we're trying to figure out is how does that impact sediment transport? I'm not the first one to look at this. Um, folks have been looking at it since the 50s, um, if not earlier, but they've identified kind of both protection and erosion by ice. Um, but they haven't really investigated or quantified at least how um, the magnitudes of those kind of compare. So the main thought was that this mechanism called ice rafting, basically where the sediment is frozen onto the ice and then kind of gets rafted away and deposited off in deeper water, that was the main thing that people were thinking was um, the predominant contributor to erosion. Um, I'm going to investigate another pro uh, process that was um, observed, but again hasn't been identified, <coughs> called hydrodynamic scour. Um, and overall, just the takeaway here is we don't have a systematic understanding of how changing ice cover uh, will affect sediment transport and therefore coastal erosion. So part of this work was inspired by um, some modeling, uh, physical modeling that was done in MOOC's lab um, in the last couple of years, and then some field photos that we saw um, from Lake Superior from our collaborator over at MSU. So here we can see a parking lot, we've got a beach, we have what's left of the ice shelf. So this has retreated quite a ways from its maximum extent. And then um, it's kind of washed out here, but you can see this kind of sinusoidal, like snake-like pattern in the offshore. And what we noticed was that correlates pretty well with the maximum extent of ice. Um, and so we wanted to figure out, so what is the mechanism um, for depositing that landform? Is it ice rafting or is it hydrodynamic scour? Um, what we're thinking is that it's a hydrodynamic scour, that we have flow acceleration at this ice front, it's presenting an obstacle to the flow, um, we're getting turbulence, scour at the base, and then sediments kind of being deposited offshore. So that's our working theory, and we wanted to be able to figure out, so if we have a different beach slope, if we have different ice extents, how is that going to change our results? How is it gonna change the sediment transport? Um, as Luke says, I use hydrodynamic modeling, and so this is the basic setup that I used um, or the basic introduction to the model that I use, which is called XBeach. Um, we use this um, numerical implementation called CERCBeat, where we're basically averaging out all the short waves, so the individual crusts aren't resolved, but the overall pattern of wave energy, we call it the wave energy envelope is. And what XBeach does is it takes the waves and calculates um, currents, and then um, calculates sediment transport, develops that into the morphology change, plugs it back into the next time step and then kind of progresses through um, until we have our final result. In order to simulate our near shore ice, I took beaches of different slopes um, and then I implemented what's called a non-erodible structure in x -beach. So this is typically used to model seawalls um, and jetties and different structures like that. But we thought, okay, if we have this operating theory that there's no sediment movement shoreward of the ice front, then this would be a pretty good approximation and at least a good first uh, approximation. So what I did is I would run the models with no ice and then I would implement this non-erodible ice layer and extend that out to a certain depth and then I would repeat that for um, each successive model run um, where I extended the ice a little bit further out, a little bit further out, basically until we got to a depth where there was no more sediment transport. Um, and remember there were kind of two um, theories that I was trying to test here, which was what is the actual um, action of ice? So is it erosive or protective? And then systematically, what are the relationships between near shore ice depth and, um, and the beach slope, et cetera? So as preliminary results, um, I have here the uh, different beach slopes that I tested it for, and then the sediment transport on the y-axis. Um, the ice-free run, so that's a model run with no ice, are the um, magenta squares <coughs> here. And then the different colored um, bubbles basically are different um, model runs where the ice is at different depths. 
And all I want to show basically is that the, um, the no ice scenarios can be more than half um, the sediment transport as the, the ice scenarios. Um, and so we're seeing about a 50 to 60 percent reduction in erosion when we're inputting ice into the system at all. Um, so that's pretty exciting because now we can say that ice is a protective feature largely, and so having ice on the coast is um, is kind of preserving the beaches or the shorelines at least to some degree using our current approximation. So, but how good is that approximation? Is that actually replicating what we're seeing um, in the near shore? I'm going to give you a little map of this figure because I find it difficult even though I made it. So each lateral row is going to be a different um, model run. So it represents where the ice is. So here the ice would be at one foot of depth or one meter, two meters of depth. Um, and then this is the normalized x-axis. So over here is the shoreline. So the ice is going to be all these white um, cells on the right. And what we're seeing, which is pretty exciting, is exactly what we saw in that photo from Lake Superior. So we're seeing scour just adjacent to the ice wall or the ice um, margin. And then we're seeing this kind of um, deposition offshore, this gradual deposition into deeper water, which is really significant because we've always been looking for this mechanism for where the sediment is going um, offshore or how is the sediment getting moved offshore. And so we're kind of able to say, well, ice is a mechanism that we haven't incorporated into previous models. Um, that kind of explains this offshore movement of sediment. Another interesting thing we found is that, um, right, so the magnitude of sediment transport is changing with depth, and there's this kind of non-monotonic response. So here I have ice depth on the x-axis here, so the ice is getting deeper, and then the sediment transport is increasing up. Um, and what we found interesting is that it doesn't start at the peak, as you might expect. Remember that the no ice runs were the highest sediment transport, so you'd almost think that those would have the higher, that the highest value would be at the shoreline. Um, but we're not seeing that. We're seeing some uh, kind of increase from an initial value and then this gradual decay as you move offshore. And so we found this really interesting and we wanted to kind of see what could explain that. Um, and so I played around with some data and what I finally landed on was the breaking depth of the wave. Um, so there's a certain um, depth for every wave that it's going to break at. Like when you see the white caps rolling over, most energy is dissipated then. And what we found was this really good relationship with the, um, the breaking depth and the maximum sediment transport of the ice. So basically what our um, conceptual model is here is when the ice is shoreward of the breaking point that the energy is dissipated before it even reaches that ice. Um, and so we don't get that um, excessive scour going down because there's not enough energy left in the um, surfboards or the waves um, to create that disturbance at the base. When ice is directly at the break point, then we're seeing the maximum energy dissipation. It's shallow enough that we're still getting interaction with the bed, um, and then we're getting that movement offshore. And then finally, for when we're deeper than the breaking point, um, we are breaking against the, um, so we're artificially breaking against the um, ice shell here, but it's too deep for those waves to interact with the bottom. And so we're, again, not seeing as much scour. So that's when the energy is kind of tailing off um, at the end of the graph. So when we look at the breaking zone and the area where we're seeing that peak sediment transport, we're seeing pretty good agreement. Um, and I didn't include it for the sake of time, but we're also seeing in the pattern of energy dissipation that this is a pretty reasonable mechanism. So really exciting for me. Um, I have a chapter of my PhD mostly done, and we have good results for it. So the summary here is that ice has impacted coastal processes. This has been previously observed, but never um, really systematically quantified. And now we have this um, kind of conceptual idea for how ice um, impacts chains with the beach slope, so basically the configuration of the near shore, um, and then the, it's the depth that the ice extends out to, how far the ice has grown in a certain year. Um, our model agrees pretty well with the morphology that we're seeing in field photos, um, and we are noticing a reduction in ice, um, and that, so that there is a reduction in ice, um, sediment transport when you have ice present, um, but that peak erosion is occurring at this depth that's determined by the break. Um, and I forgot, I put all sorts of fancy animations in my slides, so I'll just take you through those again. Okay, more frosting off, we're doing great, I'm okay on time. 
So we talked about ice in the near shore, but uh, winter is a process that kind of occurs everywhere in the system. So now I'm going to talk to you about freeze thaw, lake levels, and near shore connections. So basically what happens once we move that kind of ice interaction scenario up onto the onshore bluffs. Um, and then I'll let you go hopefully with enough time for questions. Just to bring you back to the water levels and what they're doing. So now this is in feet, but we've got the same historic period. So from 1920 uh, to about 2023. And we can see that we had this rise from 2014 up to the peak in 2020, and now we're back at the, pretty much at the average in 2023. So that should be good news. We should be seeing less erosion, and we are, um, but we have some questions still about what the lasting impacts of that high water um, is doing on the bluff system or the near shore system as a whole. So lake levels have dropped. How are the bluffs eroding? I did kind of bait and switch here. So Luke's um, previous student already figured some of this out. Um, he suggested that there's a lag time between peak erosion or peak lake levels and peak erosion rate. Um, and so basically the scenario we have is we were at this angle of repose. Remember, we raised the water levels, we over steepened the base. It's exactly what we're seeing. Um, so this is basically where we were at in 2020, right? Panel two. 2023, I can tell you we're here for some of those steeper bluffs which means we've still got quite a ways before we're feeling that recession up at the top. It's been three years, so there's at least several years into the future that we have to be preparing for these impacts for homeowners who have property up at the crest of the bluff to see the real jeopardy that these lake levels have put their homes in. I'm gonna introduce you to the mechanism that we think um, is controlling the rate of this readjustment. So this is some work that I did in uh, 2020. This is basically showing, this is a shorter bluff, so remember the time scales are gonna be a little bit different, the sediment you're gonna be adjusting a little bit differently. But the basic pattern is um, we have kind of these time series of pictures, and then for each of those um, kind of pairing of surveys, we have the DEM of difference from, for, so basically um, May to September, September to December, and then um, December to May. And what I wanna point out pretty much is the um, most erosion we see is in this December to May period. Um, so this is pretty interesting because now we're thinking, okay, there's something about the freeze and thaw process that is contributing the most amount of sediment, which has been observed before. And then another one of those students took it a step further, Colin Rowland, and he did a bunch of groundwater modeling um, and a bunch of slope stability testing. Basically what he found out is so in winter you freeze the bluff but you keep increasing the water table. So you have this transient increase in um, pore pressure in the bluffs, but you aren't able to diffuse it because you have the face of the bluff frozen. You basically put a cork in the system. And then when you thaw, you have all of this buildup of potential energy, and then um, it releases and takes a bunch of sediment with it, and you see a ton of failures. Um, so that's really interesting because um, what it says is basically freeze thaw is the rate limiting step for how quickly these bluffs adjust um, to their stable angle, how they get from an over steepened angle back to that more stable um, configuration. So we know how the bluffs are reacting. There's a lag between peak lake levels and um, peak erosion, but how is the near shore system adjusting? So that's mostly um, the component of my research I'm gonna talk about next. Again, expanding into the, um, into the near shore and kind of trying to figure out how this system is reacting because we haven't really looked at the offshore component of a lot of these processes in the past. Um, so for this next um, little bit of the talk, I'm just gonna be talking about the project that I have ongoing, but it's still preliminary work. But our goals are to measure sediment volume eroded from the bluffs and added to the beaches, measure the rates and patterns of how beaches recover, and remember the beaches act as a buffer to this whole bluff system, so the amount of beach, um, it kind of scales with the amount of erosion at the bluff. Um, and then something that we're hoping to do is observe how that sediment is incorporated um, from right, being eroded from the bluff, deposited on the shore, and then kind of moving into the offshore. So we're trying to trace that system like holistically instead of looking at it as kind of segments of a bigger process. To do this, I picked a study site that was one of those taller bluffs, right? Again, so about 140 feet. This is in Ozaukee County um, in um, Wisconsin. And what we're seeing here is the site in summer of 2020. And this is at that stage where we're seeing kind of erosion at the tall. We're just starting to see that erosion at the toe. Water levels are still increasing at this point, so we're gonna see more over-steepening of the bluff. Um, and I'll show that in some future slides. 
But how do I do this? I've shown you um, some plots that I've made, but I haven't told you how I made them. Um, I use two main methods. For the onshore um, methods, I use structure from motion. And if you haven't heard of this before, it's basically a photogrammetry um, method where you use a drone, and in our case, our drone has a really high precision GPS mounted on top of it. You take a bunch of overlapping photos, so those are the blue squares in this figure here, and you take those overlapping photos kind of in a transect, like a lawnmower pattern. And then from those overlapping photos, you can match certain points and reconstruct the 3D geometry. And what we end up spitting out of this is a three-dimensional a three-dimensional model or a digital elevation model. Um, if we take successive digital elevation models from different surveys, then we can make um, what I showed before, which is a DEM of difference. And our DEMs of difference have a resolution of about 10 centimeters, which is um, quite nice considering we didn't have to pay for LIDAR and I got to stand on a beach for a couple hours and watch a drone fly. So really low cost, great method of collecting data um, and we can really rapidly deploy when we think that there are situations like a storm where we're gonna see a lot of big change on the bluffs. Similarly for the offshore, um, so during COVID times I had a John boat that was about 12 feet long, and we were trying to figure out how I could get that into the bed of a truck alone, drive it up to my site uh, at Point Beach, and we realized that it's just not realistic, and so we got this little remote control guy, which is wonderful. He has a GPS on the top and a single beam sonar on the bottom, and I'm able to do my offshore survey standing on the beach, and usually it works well unless something gets caught in the propellers. That happened last weekend. Uh, didn't lose the boat though, Luke, don't worry. So what we do is um, basically I send a little boat out on transects that go about 300 meters out into the lake, about as far as I can still um, control the boat. Um, and then we do that for about a kilometer's length of the bluff line. And then we um, interpolate between those survey transects to get um, kind of this morphology of the near shore, which is the first um, kind of repeated time series of near shore measurements that have been obtained to this date, which is really exciting. So what have we been seeing? Again, these are preliminary results. I haven't seen um, that period where we're expecting a lot of um, you know, change due to freeze thaw. This has just been from the summer period. So in 2022, um, I have these DEMs of difference. So this is for the whole breach, and then I've just pulled out little um, pieces where I thought something interesting was going on. All the censored bits are just vegetation I haven't dealt with yet, so don't worry too much about them. Um, but what we can see is we're seeing erosion about halfway up the bluff. So this photo is kind of showing what you're seeing in this top panel here. So we're seeing erosion from the top half of the bluff, deposition onto the beach. Um, and we're seeing that in a couple spots around or along the reach, but not too many. And that sediment really isn't making it into the near shore. But what is interesting from these surveys is that we're seeing um, that the bluffs are really over steep. So I should have switched these figures, but this is October of 2022. You can see a really steep bluff here, and then just the formation of the scarp. And then in the top photo here, you'll see what that scarp has developed into. Basically right here is the exposed um, wall of the bluff now, and it's kind of wrinkled down, and you're seeing this bulge of sediment. And so that's happening pretty close to the crest, so you can see this path is right on the crest of the bluff. And so we're starting to see these impacts closer to the crest, which means that that cycle of propagation up the face of the bluff is still continuing. And this is just the first that we've been seeing of it in 2023. So that's onshore. We're seeing kind of limited um, spatial changes only in certain areas. In the offshore, it's kind of a different story. The changes are much lower in magnitude, um, but they're a lot more distributed um, spatially. So, what I can point out here is that basically we're building a bar in the near shore where this accretion is, um, right from May to October. This is kind of a low wave energy period. We're building this bar. We're kind of stealing some of the sediment um, and pulling it inshore and offshore. So there might be the start of a secondary bar. But overall, um, the most interesting thing here is that there's a net loss of sediment from the system. So my mass balance doesn't add up here. And a pretty significant amount, there's a difference. Um, and so what this is suggesting to us is that there's some sort of some state of sediment that we're not accounting for yet in our surveys. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide here. So potential sand sinks, it could be either going, if this is the beach here, it might be going along the beach further than I'm able to get with my batteries, or it might be going further offshore, deeper than I'm able to get with my little remote control guy. 
So here's the 2023 sonar profile that I've gotten. So it's about 200 meters um, in length. And we're seeing this is that bar that got built up. But if you take it in um, scope of the larger near shore profile, this is from um, LIDAR collected in 2012, we're only getting out to this first slope break. Um, and that's a problem because if we're only getting out to that first slope break, we're not getting to what some people call the depth of closure. And that's what I've traced out in this dashed line. And that depth of closure basically um, represents the depth where sediment is no longer moving. And we're only getting to about half of that with our survey. So there's a significant amount of um, depth that we still need to account for when we're talking about sediment sinks um, and sediment sources. Now, it is kind of interesting to note that usually during quiescent wave periods, like this summer where we're seeing the survey, um, usually movement is onshore. So it's pretty unlikely that you would get significant sediment movement offshore. Um, so that's something I definitely have to think more about, but that's um, work for maybe a future PhD. But just to summarize this preliminary work, what we're doing um, for linking onshore and offshore erosion, we know that freeze thaw is a, a rate limiting um, step for bluff adjustment, so we figured that out already. Um, but what we're realizing now is that we're still working on getting it adjusting um, back to that stable level for the taller bluffs. During these quiescent periods, oh, no, I did it again. <laughs> During quiescent low lake level periods, we're, we're not seeing that much onshore erosion. So there's pretty limited areas where we're seeing erosion in the bluffs. But during the offshore, we're seeing um, a lot of kind of distributed changes, but to a lower magnitude. Uh, future work is to investigate near shore sinks. I might have to get that big boat out, but this time I'll have some folks to help me. Okay, so I took you through a couple processes, and now I'm just going to summarize what that means as far as uh, future kind of projections. So these are the current understandings that I had in that first slide. So basically for precipitation, increased winter and spring, um, and increased variability. And what does that mean in light of what I've just been talking about to you for the last 40 minutes or so? So basically that transient pore water pressure effect where the bluff is failing due to the increased potential, um, we're gonna exacerbate that mechanism. So if you're increasing winter precipitation, then you're gonna build up that pore water pressure further and you're gonna have more potential to erode sediment when it does finally thaw. Um, as far as increasing temperatures, we're expecting um, increased number of freeze thaw cycles. And so we're gonna tighten that coupling up between peak lake levels and peak erosion because now we're going to be able to erode and freeze and then erode more often throughout any given year. <coughs> As far as lake levels, right, we're increasing the variability, increasing the magnitude of these changes and the frequency. Um, so increasing the rate of change is going to change the amount that the beach is able to recover before it has to endure the next high lake level cycle. Um, and we're also going to increase the extremes, right, so that's gonna stress the coastal infrastructure more. We still haven't hit low lake level periods during my PhD, so we have yet to see how those um, changes might kind of inter in interact with the system. Um, and then as far as ice cover, right, I talked to you about how nearshore ice impacts erosion. Um, and basically the big takeaway is that if we have decreased ice cover, we're going to see increased erosion, right? So having ice present on the shoreline does buffer the system a little bit. Um, but if we're also having less ice cover, we're going to more often be at that point where the lake um, ice is in that kind of sweet spot for peak erosion when ice is present. Um, so these are all, again, kind of arm wavy because we're not sure what the climate is going to do, um, but it's something to think about, right, again, when we're appreciating, we have to understand these processes in the present before we start making these predictions of how they'll change in the future. So those are my conclusions. Basically, climate changes on the Great Lakes will be um, pretty complex, and I'm sure some folks in this room are better equipped to tell you about that, um, but our current understanding is that they're going to become more variable. And when we're talking about more variability, we need to understand the impacts um, of these constituent processes at all levels um, or all degrees of lake level before we start um, making predictions. So I'll leave you with some more drone footage. I'll thank my collaborators and my funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Chelsea. We have time for questions. Somebody's hand shoot up. Frank? I have two questions. Okay. Well, great, excellent talk. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I was just wondering, how do you how do you define the line where the sediment stops moving? Yeah. So um, Fran's question was, how do I define that depth of closure? Yeah. Um, so basically, that has to do. Um, it's kind of a nebulous concept because it's dependent on looking at any period of wave condition. So the depth of closure is dependent on, you know, let's say looking at only winter wave condition. We're looking for the highest winter wave condition. So it depends on what time period you're looking at. That depth of closure can kind of change if you're looking at, say, the annual depth of closure versus the decadal depth of closure. Um, I don't have the equations offhand as far as how I actually um, would calculate it, but you can do it based on wave height, basically, and period. And then you had another question? Yeah. Just wondering, in your DEM creation method, um, do you eliminate the vegetation? Yeah, so we use um, a, basically a machine learning algorithm in Cloud Compare to kind of filter out the vegetation. Um, it works best um, when it's still, structural motion is still not the best at dealing with vegetation because it can't see through it, like with LIDAR. Um, but there are ways to at least minimize the amount of vegetation that's in the model. I have a clarification. You showed an image where <clears throat> you had what you call the scarp mm -hmm. that seemed to be very far inland from the slope. And if I'm trying to tie that back to your sort of your idealized model, is that final part that's broken off, it is that far inland? So um, to clarify, this is the crest of the bluff. This is a first part of the slope, and then it gets really steep. So if there's, okay. yeah, so this is still part of the slope of the bluff, even though it looks pretty vegetated. It's just been stable for longer than where we're seeing the erosion at the toe. But that difference, that distance between where the top, in that, as, it, as the erosion marches up the bluff, mm -hmm. there is a significant erosion inland that? Right, yes, exactly. That's what we're worried about is that crest right. retreat is still coming for taller bluffs. Okay. And then a question, do you look at ice shelves and their role? You said that ice is protecting from erosion. How do ice shelves play into that? Ice shelves. Ice shelves when where it's where it's where you're pushing all sorts of ice as the ice goes out and pushes on shore if the wind direction. Yeah, so especially with my model, we're not going to be able to resolve those types of processes. Um, we're only able to look at um, if it's a stationary um, feature. Okay. Um, so I know that there are some folks who have looked at that ice ride up and how it moves sediment around. Uh, one of Luke's PhD students, Steph Dodge, did a lot of work coring these ice shells and watching how they decay. They could pile paper come out. Okay. Um, so it's definitely something of interest, but it's not part of my research. Um, so thinking about you, this is actually great because you just said stationary things. Um, so I was curious with increased variability and instability, so especially if we're seeing like changes in ice volume throughout a season, right? Like here we see like the lakes freeze over and then they will partially thaw out. Mm -hmm. um, is there a time component in your models? Like is there a set time that the ice has to be at a particular spot um, in order for that scour to occur? And so if you're having the ice move around a lot during the season, is it potentially going to not occur as much because it's never establishing like that kind of steady state. Yeah, so in my model, basically the assumption is that it is at a steady state and that it's staying there, but there is variability in where the ice will ground. Um, we're still not super sure on what controls that. There's some evidence that sandbar kind of control these different pinpoints for the ice. Um, I would love to be able to put some kind of spatially varying ice component into it, but with the way that I set up the bathymetry or the like bottom um, contours of my model, it would be hard to preserve the sediment changes um, from a previous run of ice. Um, but yeah, I would expect if we're seeing increased variability, um, we're probably going to, right, so say you freeze out to a certain depth and then you start retreating, you know, more or less, that's going to change the depth at which we're seeing the ice, and we're going to see it at multiple spaces along that profile. So you showed how sensitive the erosion is to the presence or absence of ice. I'm wondering, have you looked at all about wind speed, how, how sensitive the, the uh, effect is for erosion? Then, because if you have ice-free conditions, but 
strong wind versus a 40 mile an hour wind in those kinds of things. Is that something you would come for in the modeling or not? Yeah, so not in the modeling that I showed, but I have run it for different wave conditions, which would um, you know, kind of suggest different wave heights. Um, and so what we're seeing is that as you increase the wave height, which would suggest increased wind speed, um, that we're seeing right a greater magnitude of erosion. And it's consistent with that breakpoint hypothesis that I showed, where it just shifts offshore that maximum, that peak sediment transport area. Um, but I think some smarter folks than I have, have modeled the increase in wave speed um, with less ice cover, but it's definitely a consideration. So I want to ask you a question, which I, I believe you've not looked at yet, but just to get some thoughts on it. So, uh, so two things. One is the lake levels are managed to an extent, right? You showed that very early on. Mm -hmm. Is there is there anything that could be? Um, <clears throat> would you have any suggestions for how these lake levels are managed um, through the lens of you know, coastal erosion? So erosion. From my understanding is the change in lake levels from management is very small compared to the fluctuations we see on other scales, so versus evaporation and precipitation. To manage the, specifically if we're talking about Lake Michigan, to manage Lake Michigan to a point where we're influencing the long-term lake level, um, we would have to have a completely different outlet. Like the geometry of that outlet would have to be expanded so much to a point that I don't think it's feasible. Um, so as far as I know, I don't know that it's realistic, but I might be mistaken. Okay, that's fine. And then the second question is, so I assume that um, for these um, coastal areas that you've looked at, there's there's not really any infrastructure at all, like like even a dock or, a, or something like that, right? And so, um, as I'm sure you're aware, when, when you have some of those coastal infrastructure pieces in place, we see different erosion processes mm -hmm. happening, right? which have effects on the bluff. So you maybe steered away from those on purpose. Um, do these things like, it, would, would, it, would one of them exacerbate the other one, so to speak? Yeah, so, so the question is, that's clear. yeah, sorry. does infrastructure on the shoreline have downstream effects? Sh sure, so I, I think, you know, like when you look at what Concordia has done right. with, with hardening that infrastructure, you see a lot of erosion downstream. Right. So um, Concordia, if anybody's unfamiliar, is this university that did this huge bluff restoration project. Basically, they um, mowed their bluff down to a more stable slope. So they pulled it back a little bit, but made it down to a more stable slope. They had this really nicely armored shoreline. And then a bunch of homeowners down drift of them started seeing really intense rates of erosion. And I think the last I heard was that they sued Concordia and won because they were able to show that their bluff restorations directly caused more erosion of their property. So yeah, so I've been avoiding that specifically. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's that's okay. It, it's um, again, it's a tricky system to manage because, like I said, you can manage the bluffs great, but then you're going to lose all your beaches, which have has an impact downstream. Um, so it's. I'm not in management for a reason because it is a very big problem, but I'm just hoping to kind of add to this knowledge base. Yeah. I had a couple of more big picture questions. Um, are there certain community organizations or decision makers that are using your imagery to make decisions on management? And then also, um, is this is there a large portion of the Great Lakes being monitored by drones? Is this really like you and other groups? Is this just a limited area? Most of the Great Lakes have not been monitored. Yeah, so um, as for the first question, there are organizations. I hope that they take my um, research into consideration. Um, there are some organizations that we work uh, with. Like, so I'm funded by Sea Grant, um, which puts out a lot of um, educational materials um, that they supply to homeowners. There's no disclosure clause in real estate right now in Wisconsin, so there's no way for me to go door to door and say your bluff is eroding. You should think about that. Um, but there are ways that they supply information to the community, um, and I'm hoping that might is valuable enough to be incorporated someday. Um, and the second question was, um, is, are most of the Great Lakes yeah. unmonitored at this point? Is this really like an exception, this area that you're studying? Yeah, so there are monitoring programs, large-scale monitoring efforts in place. Um, typically, they use airborne LIDAR. Um, those have been running more frequently in the past um, decade or so, but that's still only every few years. 
Um, and so as far as like really high resolution data, it's pretty limited to the study sites that I and other researchers around the Great Lakes have, have chosen to, to work with. It's kind of a related question. I wonder if there are records like in news reports of impacts of high lake levels back in the 50s, and 70s, and 80s, even when, based on the data you showed, the lake level was much higher. Right. As yeah, no, there absolutely are. Um, and there's some ortho imagery, some <coughs> historic imagery that folks have worked off of. Um, in some places, it's really hard to find pinpoints to ortho rectify um, those aerial images. Um, and it runs into a similar problem of is we don't know what's going on offshore still. So we might see how the bluff was eroding, but we don't necessarily know what's controlling that other than lake levels have some play in it. So yeah, but there definitely are. And um, the last, so Dave Michelson um, is my forefather at UW Madison who did a lot of this research in the uh, 70s and 80s. Um, and so I have to finish my PhD while people are still concerned about the high lake levels and the erosion because it'll be another 30 years um, otherwise, well, I can't say that. Another indeterminate amount mm -hmm. of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about does any physical phenomena like a drought which might affect the soil moisture in turn affects the erosion due to waves or that's like like does that precondition the soil or the the area for more erosion or? Yeah. So I would think so. So especially um, during lower lake levels. Um, the way that we're restoring the bluff to a stable slope is basically by dumping a bunch of sediment down at the bottom and it's kind of like buttressing. But I would think it's unconsolidated even more so than what we're seeing um, in the bluffs. Um, and so that would probably erode a lot quicker than the, than the stuff that's still in that layer cake formation. So I would think, yeah, definitely that the more loose and kind of the more moisture that's in that soil, the more like the less true stress it would have, the more likely it would be to erode. So. Great questions. Any more? All right. Well, let's thank Chelsea again. Thank you very much.